Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Today we'll be talking to Cornell Kappa and Burke Uzzle. Their stands on the corner of 94th Street and 5th Avenue, one of New York City's newest and most significant museums, the International Center of Photography, which recently celebrated its sixth birthday. And everyone agrees that it was created through the enterprise, determination, and sheer unwillingness to say no of its founder and director, Cornell Kappa. He and our other distinguished guest, Burke Uzzle, are the representatives of a relatively new 20th century breed, the photographer journalist, who bring not only concern and camera, but mind and insight into the events and people that move the world. A very warm welcome to both of you. Cornell, why did photography require a new museum? We keep present in a different kind of a manner work which gets only published in magazines and in photographs, in magazines and, and, uh, and books. So basically, uh, a place where you could exchange ideas, where you could discuss ideas, where you can present work on a regular basis, where you give a home for photographers and photography, that was a need that was not serviced before the center was born. Why don't you dazzle us a bit with your accomplishment? What was the attendance when it opened? What is it six short years later? And how do you feel about what you helped unleash? The greatest dazzle is that we're alive and well. That's the miracle. <laughs> <laughs> the second dazzle is that we presented about 82 major exhibitions. We change exhibits every two months, six, six to eight weeks. We have uh, two semesters of teaching. Uh, with 2,500 students participating in them. Uh, we have published a number of catalogs and books, and I think we have created a public for photography. I think we have increased photo photographic awareness on the part of the viewers, and we have presented and we have provided a platform both for discussion and for presentation of work for over a thousand photographers from all over the world. Now that everyone has a good camera and can take a technically perfect picture, perhaps you tell us, Burke, what's the difference between good pictures and good snapshots? Well, I suppose the good pictures simply have a higher visual order or imperative, and the snapshots depend upon a sense of um, a kind of intuitive recognition and may or may not succeed on other levels, uh, which might be, might be just fine. Uh, I think there are some very distinguished good snapshots. Uh, I think what I'm really asking is when does an image deserve and to sustain the basic definition of what can be considered fine art? I suppose when you can keep looking at it and keep finding more and more in the photograph as you look at it over a period of time and, and feel that it sustains you and nourishes you on the first one level and then another, both as, it's, both as your own capacity to appreciate grows and, and uh, as the photograph simply becomes more powerful in its own right over a period of time. If the photographs of your story for a magazine are accepted and they are printed, they had this other element of, of, of acceptance because they, they have met whatever tests they, they had to meet. And of course, you got paid for them. Now, if, you are, if your photographs are now for sale in galleries, in uh, being, being bought at auctions, being accepted in, in museum collections, then you know that you have that other element as well. But some, somehow, a financial recognition of value seems to be part of the answer. Burke Geisel started his career at age 15. By the time he was 17, was a photographer for a well-known daily newspaper in your native North Carolina, the Raleigh News and Observer. And then I guess you went on to Atlanta and Houston, where you were based as a freelance uh, magazine photographer. And by the time you were 23, you were a Life magazine photographer. 
before you can tell us how that came about, would you be good enough to tell us what a 15-year-old does as a commercial photographer? I had a man that worked for me, a retired man that worked for me, who, uh, because I was so small and I was so skinny and so insignificant looking, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have the presence of um, appearance to knock on a door and, and ask for a sitting, but, but uh, this retired gentleman would go from door to door and, and um, show some samples and say that uh, the photographer would be delighted to come by and take a picture of the baby for a, for a dollar. And then uh, you appeared? And he would book appointments for me, and then I would come back a few days, much to the amazement of the concerned parents, as opposed to concerned photographers. <laughs> and in that short period of time, how did you get to Life magazine? I think I just annoyed them to death, and they finally gave me assignments. I kept calling on them with ideas, and, and uh, they were very decent folks. They, uh, they always listened carefully, and they gave me work, and then they gave me better work, and I was, I was lucky, and I worked hard. I worked very hard, and I had the help of a couple of really wonderful life correspondents who, who somehow or another just believed in letting me work for them. Did you work as an assistant to any of them? No. No, I never did. I assisted other photographers, but never life photographers. I hung around a lot with them. Uh, one of the really great photographers later on at life, John Mealy, when I uh, printed photographs in his studio, and uh, he let me use his darkroom and let me look at his work and, and criticized mine a lot, which is the best thing that can happen to a young photographer. You made reference to the concerned photographer, a phrase that is not only identified with Lewis Hine, but surely with Cornell Kappa. The wonderful thing about uh, Lewis Hine that he was, he did not call himself a concerned photographer. The term did not come into usage until actually the late 1960s, in a decade of the 60s. Did you invent the phrase, you and your group, the Fund for Concern well, Photography? Well, I really invented the phrase because I wanted to get an exhibition going of a group exhibition which would express some common denominator for six people that I had in mind for it. I looked for the common denominator, what it was, what to call it. And I eventually, on one of my trips to my winter vacation, I said, Eureka, to my wife. I said, I got it. She says, you, you, she says what, what is it that you got? This time. <laughs> so I said, I, I really have the title for, for our exhibition. It's the, because it is their concern for mankind is what, the, what, the, what it's all about. And uh, of course, the, from there to the concerned photographer was just one step away. And uh, of course, again, I'm very proud of the one thing that happened, that the, all, all of the concerned groups that sprung, they sprang after the concerned photographer. So, and I think it's only befitting that, that photographer is the concerned human being who brings it to the rest of the people, who has a capacity to bring the witness, the true eyewitness of our generations of this century or before, but we didn't quite use the term. It's very really funny, you know, to think about that, that in all the newspapers, you had always had eyewitness reports. It was never the photographer. And of course, the original eyewitness is the photographer, for God's sakes. So uh, I found, I, I was very pleased by the notion that the concerned photographer was the first concerned habit as a human being who cared. What are the criteria that you use? Excellence and commitment and integrity. Among the things that Cornell does is to use art criteria for photography. And he's obviously demonstrated that you can take the photographs out of a magazine and put them into a museum, including your photographs, Burke. Now, I've heard you say that photography isn't art. I wonder if you really mean that. And if you would tell us if you think photography is an art or to pay it another kind of compliment, is it journalism? Just what is it? It's just not something that I spend much time thinking about. Um, and I don't really feel myself um, prepared to, to say whether it is or it isn't. I can only really tell you that, that um, I suppose when I read biographies of, of 
of artists, and they talk about restlessness and, and things that they feel when they when they they work and so forth. I think I feel something in common with those feelings. I think you've said recently that you'd like to see uh, a lot more good photography and a lot less preening. The photography itself is a very easy medium to be catchy and tricky and manipulative and, and to look very facile and very... More so, you think, than other art forms? I don't know about other art forms. I don't handle any other art forms. But I know photography is easy to do, uh, to do tricks in and to it's be... It's faster. It's faster and it's convincing. Mean, At the same time, it's fast. It has this aura of authenticity. I wonder if, in your view, you would tell us, at least historically, some of the photos that you consider of sufficient aesthetic, historic, technological content to be classified as a masterpiece. Oh, boy. You brought it up. <laughs> well, Burke, <Brooke, laughs> which picture of yours is? <laughs> Uh, probably none. <laughs> How about some of those Cambodian pictures? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they're masterpieces. The boys I wish the they tree. were. I think it's a fine photograph, but I'm not, I think it's too early to talk about masterpieces. Um, that picture has more to do with the celebration of a feeling, and whether or not that feeling is to later be perceived as a masterpiece, I think is really something we have to think about a lot later. Some of them have to do much with being repeated images that you remember which is, of course, one of the catch of the problem also, because many people remember masterpieces because they have seen them before, and that's kind of a, a double play. Familiarity and the comfort of recognition. Right, right. But that doesn't, does familiarity alone make a masterpiece? Well, uh, you, you start realizing that it is. If it has engaged so many people for such a st sustained period of time, and you then start looking for the qualities that have done the, that? The, the moonrise over Hernandez, which, which, which is, Going to is that mythic or masterpiece at this juncture? At this point, I think it's getting to the masterpiece stage. Uh, Arikaki Besson's uh, wedding couple on the swing. Mm. Uh, my brother's photograph of the of the falling soldier at the moment of death. The couple of pictures, a number of pictures of W. G. Smith of the Spanish village essay. One of them is the man laid out, the dead man, and the family surrounding the man. And as photographed by light and all, it's, 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 it, it, uh, to, to me, it, it, it talks to me. And I think it keeps on talking to me 30 years later. The serious photograph, the Flatiron Building, would you? Well, it could be. And of course, I'm the steerage, and you, you go down the line of it. But some of them are really somewhat tricky because of the repetition and an aura that surrounds them. And the, the, one of the interesting things about what we're really talking about, which is interesting about the newer decades, because we saw all these photographs only in, in, in printed form, printed in magazines, books, and reproduction manner. Now you can see the originals exhibited and it makes a terrific difference, and people, we are, all of us, photographers, public and all, start seeing qualities in it on the original print, which we were, we were not privileged to, to, to partake in before. And in your both lives and careers uh, have changed markedly during the course of the last decade as well. Um, you did a great deal of commercial work, annual reports, all the things that permit one to sustain themselves and uh, while you do what you call your private work, how do you see your work evolving? Aside from being in partnership with the Internal Revenue Service, I, I just try and I just try and do the commercial work. Um, I try and do that as well as I can and decently and as I can with craft and with responsibility. Uh, and then I dismiss it and think about my personal work, which is. I suppose about what I am. I like to photograph things that that are that I care about. And you and it's very, it's why don't we talk about thing. some of the things that you care about? You found a great deal of symbolism, I would say, if I may, in the banal, from shopping centers to airports to bikers. What is it about those subjects that involve you so? Are you telling us something about our society, about consumerism? What is the organizing principle of that part of your work? 
Well, it has to be an, an, an aspect of the American culture and, and as personified by a fellow who grew up in America at a, at a time, a specific time in a specific place. It's a country which moves me tremendously. I travel a lot, but I always have the most fun in America. And the things that, I, that give me a kick about America, the craziness, the humor, uh, the bizarre, the loneliness, the starkness, the, uh, the dynamic of the line visually. It's, it's quite apart from Europe, I find. It's a, I think it produces very different photographers, very different vision. Things go at angles and, you know, there are spaces that Would are different. Could you contrast the two for us, please? As well as I can understand it, Europe seems to be more about curves and America seems to be more about lines. But uh, I don't know, it's a generalization to which I'm sure there are many exceptions. But um, you know, architecturally and you know, the, the placement of buildings, the, the nature of streets, the, um, the pace at which the people move, the materials used and, and uh, all kinds of consumer goods, the look of automobiles, all kinds of things, the, the sound of the music which grew up he here and um, you know, the parochialism of the, I mean, the, the way the country has fairly tight borders compared to Europe and, and it focuses upon itself. It's a, um, all of these aspects of America, I think, they produced in me at least a person who, who likes to be on the road, who likes to be moving, who likes the highway culture, who likes the shopping center. In the past decade, Cornell, you have spent as much of your time, perhaps even more so, as a an historian, as an administrator, than a photographer. Do you ever regret having so little time these days for your own creation? And has the museum affected your own photographic work? Well, I have resolved my problem much simpler than, than, than Burke. Uh, from the day of, uh, of uh, starting the center, I have taken no photographs. I felt, still do, very much so that uh, the kind of reporting work, eyewitness work, uh, that I do, many other photographers can do it as well or better or almost as well, it makes a difference. The quality of the work is, is not, not that crucial to the verity of what you bring back. So I did not think that I was unique enough to make that, po that point to be uniquely mine, that it would be so thoroughly missed. Uh, on the other hand, there was no center existing, and I felt uniquely qualified by my, 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 my attitudes to photography, that I might be able to do what was, until that point, not possible to do. Why did you choose to show the Burkezel vision of Cambodia? Because he has achieved a quality which was beyond the immediate, which had classic forms, which was an attempt to go beyond that particular dramatic, tragic event. And 30 years from now, I might pick up his photographs and I will re-feel visually, aesthetically, and emotionally what it was in, in 1980 to be a Cambodian refugee. And I don't care if any of my photographs will be ever bought and hung by anyone. It's not my, not my intention. The last book uh, of mine with the word, a sociologist, demographer, called Margin of Life, which I finished in 1973, a year before the center actually opened. The book came out at the time when the center opened. And it's a book about poverty and, and land and human suffering and maldistribution of everything. And we picked on two countries to, to make the, uh, the presentation possible. It, it was Honduras and El Salvador. We work on human lives and images of people really going through their own torturous road to death and fighting for principles fighting for their lives. The hope was, in the case of Louis Hine, who managed to bring uh, child labor into focus by publication of his work, he was able to get a Child Labor Act passed. But not by, initially. By Congress. Werner Bischoff went to India, to the Bihar province, and uh, they were dying of hunger. 
and Congress sent them some wheat. Mm -hmm. So there are some direct effects. The, the Vietnam War, through television and uh, still photography, managed to bring to the American public the knowledge of what that war was about. And of course, we have never had in the United States such a violent political time as through the decade of Vietnam because photography, imagery, brought it home and we have revolted here. Was that photography or a television that uh, brought that for home? Me, the, for me, it's only the question now of, of, a, of a change of technology. What Life magazine used to do on a weekly basis as a unique carrier of visual images of what was happening in the world in a kind of a selective, powerful way, that technique has been taken over by television with a tremendous impact. Life had... Well, what does that mean for the photographer? Well, I'll, I'll get to it. 11 million people would be looking at every issue of life a week later. Today, uh, 60 minutes, the magazine of the air is being watched by 60, 90, 120 million people for a full hour of concentration. And they can affect a much larger audience with a much greater impact, not only working through the visual, but audio, visual effect, and commentary thrown in for kicks. Burke, if I may, what was your intent when you went to Cambodia? And how do you compare your experience, at least emotionally, professionally, with what Cornell just describes? Well, I think Cornell, I think he may underestimate the, I think some of the power that his photographs might have had and, and that the medium can have. Um, I photographed some people uh, and some, especially children that were later published in magazines and or later seen in magazines. And I know people traveled to Cambodia to, to look for and try and adopt specific kids that were seen. And I was attracted to the, in a, in a very personal way, to, to the nature of, of existence under those circumstances. I wanted to see what it looked like. It was a matter of curiosity. It was a matter of, of uh, somehow, in some way, feeling um, a similarity of, of um, I don't know, concern about existence, I suppose. I mean, it's, I mean, I just felt I had to go. It was a very much intuitive thing. It's you once said about your Cambodian pictures that I hope they reflect the subject first and that I gave myself to the refugees. What do you mean? What was the nature of that, in a sense, gift of yourself, that gift of self that you think you've shared? Well, I think probably that for me, as I understand photography, and certainly for myself, that, that the best photography comes when, when the photographer gives rather than takes. I think you give of your energies, you give of your understanding, you give of your perceptions and, and all that you are. You filter that subject matter through all that you've become and experienced, and you give something back. I mean, I think that really is what brings joy, what brings growth. And, and uh, not only the person that does it, but the person that receives it. So I had hoped that I would be able to give something of myself to those people that really that, that, that did a lot for me in a strange way. They taught me a lot about survival. They taught, taught me an awful lot about what life is, you know, in, a, in a, an incredibly strong and primitive way. And, and I, you know, I've, I'll never be the same again for having seen that and for seeing those people. I understand from reading New York Times uh, fairly recently, true or false, because one really doesn't know anymore what, what the angle of the story is, that the Cambodia famine problem has diminished. Well, it must have diminished due to much of the work done by still photographers and by other visual, radio, etc., and word reporting. So I think it has some effect one way or the other. Which one has more, the Lord knows. Certainly in the case of Vietnam, the burning Buddhist monk, the picture of Eddie Adams is for the killing of the, uh, sure. the uh, police chief, police chief killing the Viet Cong person in the street. 
which shocked us by its uh, inhumanity of one to the other, and the child burning on the road, the napalm running towards a camera. Uh, these are all still images which really imprinted upon our minds. You were one of the originators, Cornell, of Magnum, and you, uh, Burke, its most recent past president. What does that all about? What does the word mean? How does it function? What is its role? A lot of that is mythic as well. Can you tell us briefly what, how Magnum originated and what its current function is? The exciting thing about its birth, basically, it started out with my brother, Cartier Henri Cartier son, and David Seymour Shim in 1936, Paris. The 35 millimeter camera was just invented, sort of. And these three had an idea that they can do some photo reporting with a camera without posing anybody because, it, because they could move. And from that beginnings came the major magazines of the world almost simultaneously, like the invention of photography. Everybody invented it at the same time. It's a, it's a family. It's not really a corporation. It's, a, it's an experience. It's a human experience. It's sharing your time with not only your work, but other people to whom uh, work is similarly important, and it's a, I think it's a wonderful place to be because of that, that sense of excitement and unrest and, and response. Who are some of the members? Um, well, in New York, uh, there are members of New York and Paris, but um, Elliot Irwin, uh, Bruce Davidson, Charles Harbutt, um, Leonard Fried, uh, Cornell Kappa, uh, Wayne Miller, uh, this goes on and on. And what was your most We're, memorable experience during your presidency? Um, I have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my most memorable experience was the day I was able to, to hand it over to the current president, <laughs> Philip Charles Griffiths. <laughs> that was the same thing I thought <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a wonderful experience to do and to be out of. Uh, it's with the greatest of relief that, you, that you've done your, your job and, and paid your dues and can then go take photographs again which is, after all, why you're there in the first place. And that's what we're waiting for you to do, Cornell. But when uh, will that be? Soon, but I have one more, one more word about Magnum, which I think is, 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 is instead of a corporation, it's the word cooperative. Because in, in its best sense, that's what it is. And in its best sense, that's what photography is. Thank you, Cornell Kaffa, for being with us. Thank you. Burke Uzzel, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Mm -hmm.